Welcome to episode 19 of the Sports Geek Podcast. On today's episode, we talk to Dan Butterly from the Mountain West. And what does the NFL's deal with Twitter mean for sports fans? And how will Facebook respond? Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host, who once was mayor of Lakers Locker Room on Foursquare, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. Yes, I was mayor of the Lakers Locker Room for a short while in 2010 when attending seat in Los Angeles, and I was lucky enough to steal it from good friend Shane Harmon as he was flying back to New Zealand. A little bit of fun playing on Foursquare there. Uh, On this week's show, I chat to good friend Dan Budley from the Mountain West, looking back at how the conference was formed back in 1999 and how the landscape has changed uh, as far as understanding their fan base and, and how digital has made some big differences in that space. Uh, later on in the episode, we look at uh, Twitter's deal that they did recently with the NFL and how Facebook responded and how they're really, really for the fight of the sports fans is on in earnest now. And then later in the show, stay tuned. I have a look at how brands are trying to engage sports fans on Twitter and in this case, doing it very poorly. So I'll come off the long run there. But first, here's my interview and discussion with Dan Budley from the Mountain West on ABC Grandstand with Francis Leach. Francis Leach with you. G'day, Sean Callanan, digital sports guru from Sports Geek HQ, our regular visitor on a Saturday morning talking sport in the digital realm. Hello, Sean. G'day, Frank. How are you doing? Not too bad. Uh, the United States at the moment shut down. Well, part of, part of it is shut down. Or, yeah. Has sport shut down as well? With the well, government most, shut down? Most of it hasn't been. Most of it hasn't been affected, but there have been a few. And, and unfortunately, uh, Air Force and Navy and Army uh, have football teams. And they do. They can't fly around because the government has shut it down. So unfortunately, no money to put the fuel in the planes. Well, yeah, it, it, the funny thing is, uh, you know, Air Force Falcons are uh, a football team and uh, they were supposed to play this weekend and they won't be playing this weekend because the government shut down. I actually did see United have actually tweeted and, and offered to, to fly them, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to happen. But uh, it's a bit disappointing that the government shutdown has affected it uh, that much, but... Uh, the, uh, the Air Force Falcons are actually part of uh, the Mountain West Conference. Now, I love this part about American college sport because it's, it's, it's unique in a way. It's organic that the organisation of the sport runs on an almost quaint system, particularly when it's organising its, uh, its bowl games in a, a system of where a panel sits down and decides on the performances which teams are deserving of which opportunities. And there, there's little cabals that are together, the different conferences, the Pac-10, uh, and now this one you talk about. But this one's got a special history. Yeah, so I think we've got uh, as Dan Butterly, the Senior Associate Commissioner, on the line from the Mount West Conference. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, g'day, Dan. How are you doing? Doing great, Sean. What's going on today? Oh, it's it's a good a good weekend here in uh, in Melbourne. But uh, just wanted to tell Francis and uh, the listeners about the history of the Mountain West, how it only only started in 1999. Now, Francis rattled off some of the bigger names in uh, college sports, but... Uh, you want to tell a little bit of the Mountain West's story? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the uh, Mountain West was formed back in uh, late 1998. Uh, eight institutions, eight eight teams from the uh, Western Athletic Conference broke away from that 16-institution uh, conference in the Western Athletic Conference and formed the Mountain West. And so we started out officially July 1st, 1999, with our first competitive academic year um, with eight institutions and obviously a, a lot of transition since then. Why the breakaway? I think more than anything, the 16-team conference was was stretched from Louisiana all the way to Hawaii. It, wow. it was you know four different time zones. It was uh, very much institutions that weren't the same academically, athletically when it came to budgets, facilities, those type of things. So it, it wasn't uh, institutions that were playing on an equal footing. And I think the institutions that were probably the the more the prestigious names, the historical names, the teams that had traditional rivalries, wanted to get back to those traditional rivalries, wanted to compete on an equal playing field. I think that was a big reason that they formed the Mountain West back in 99. And so looking back then at, at that time, effectively is in this startup mode uh, for a conference, what were some of the things you had to do just to, to, to start forming that identity for the Mountain West, really you know, competing against these bigger conferences? 
I think that the number one thing that you had to do is you really had to restart from from the ground up. I mean, even though these inst- eight of these institutions have been playing each other, some for 90 to 100 years, you know, forming a new league, really you got to start things from scratch, and that's you know establishing your your football, basketball, cross country, track and field schedules uh, across the board, establishing. Um, your conference office staff, uh, where the office will be located, your television partnerships. I mean, you really had to start things from the ground up. And and one of the things that that is always difficult, and and actually there's a brand new league that started this year called the American Athletic Conference. I know what their staff is going through because I've been here since 99. You really have trouble creating that brand identity. People still associate the institutions with the previous conference. And and even your radio announcers, your TV announcers, and those individuals that are broadcasting the game – the teams may be in the Mountain West at that point, but they were still calling them members of the Western Athletic Conference. So when you're, when you're starting up a branding, a marketing uh, campaign, trying to establish the new league, that, that was one of the most difficult things you had to do was try to re-educate fans that had been you know, fans of these institutions and, and conferences for many years. And the other thing you did was establish your own television network in order to sort of cover off and, uh, the, the games and you know, be in control of your own destiny in a sense to be able to provide uh, – you know content for those who are into the teams that you have in your conference. Absolutely. That was one of the great things that we did do was we created the Mountain West Network, and it was the first conference network dedicated solely to one athletic conference. And it it worked very well for us for a number of years. It really allowed us to control our destiny. When our games we played, our presidents, uh, the presidents of the universities that make up our board of directors, really put an emphasis of trying to get back to playing Saturday football. And 97% of our games were played on Saturdays when we had the Mountain West Network. So it, it was really a, a good situation for us. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the network w- was shut down last year for us to come back onto ESPN uh, and the ESPN family of networks, but it was a good good branding identity and uh, situation for us relative to broadcast television. Uh, so, so, Dan, um, just to give Francis some, uh, some knowledge, uh, I work with Dan uh, in that startup phase and did some fan research around helping the Mountain West understand their fan base. But over those uh, 15, almost 15 years, uh, the access to data and the and the knowledge of your fans has changed a lot. What's the Mountain West, you know, what's the Mountain West know now uh, that they didn't know 15 years ago? Just be, be the amount of data that you can get from social uh, and digital, you know, email campaigns and those kind of things. No, Sean, excellent point. You and, you and Mark Seymour back when we did the research, the, the Mountain West had no research. We had no data. None of our institutions had really done research to find out who their fans were, who we were, those type of things. So to, to really establish that data early on before social media, before you really had analytics that you could use, I mean, you had to go out and, and do field research. You had to go do in-person research. And that was extremely important for us to develop a brand and, and an identity for the league uh, and since then, we've done research every couple of years at, at our basketball championships in Las Vegas, which is probably our biggest social event of the year when it comes to all of our institutions, all of their fan bases getting together at one location over a five- or six-day period. Uh, so we've continued the research. But I, I would tell you, social media nowadays between Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, you, you really get a sense of what fans want from your conference, what kind of information will they want, what they want to follow, what they don't want to follow – and, and, and it's a vital aspect of our operation at this point. And you recently would have you launched all of that uh, with a with a slight rebrand, a bit of a tweak, uh, rebranding the it as uh, MW, uh, effectively dropping the C in a lot of your branding. How has that been received by the fans? It's actually a lot of people had referred to us as Mountain West anyway. So dropping the word conference off the Mountain West in our in our normal day to day conversation has been very good. And, and in fact, Sean, another note. You know, we talked about the Mountain West Network, which which was a linear television broadcast network. You know, one of the reasons that we were okay relinquishing the rights to that network was because of the fact that we could establish a digital network, a network that was based very much online. That we could we could establish games, broadcast hundreds more games uh, via that that medium than what we were able to do via linear television. And now, you know, we've changed our website address just in the last couple of months to the MW. Dot com. Now you can see live games, press conferences on down the list through that portal that wasn't available to us under a linear platform. And now that you've gone back to the ESPN uh, family in that sense, and you know, I guess aggregated with the other conferences, has it changed the perception of Mountain West, seeing that you had a, a, a unique uh, and independent approach to things prior to that? 
I think a lot of one of the things we heard, Francis, was literally a, a situation that our fans were upset that we weren't on the ESPN network. So anymore, it was almost like that, it was it was like an act of disrespect that you weren't considered uh, in the same realm as the others. Very much so. I mean, yep. fans were complaining that they couldn't see our highlights on Sports Center uh, on on those type of ESPN platforms anymore, and you know that was one of the, the key motives of of us moving and changing our, our television strategy a little bit with all the conference realignment was to get back on ESPN when we could get back on ESPN. So fans not only you know nationally here in the United States but internationally could watch our games as well. Well, thank you very much, Dan. I hope to uh, come back and catch some of those Mountain West games. Some of the best games of basketball I've seen are in the Mountain West Conference Championship games. So Produce some stars, too. They have, Andrew Bogut being one. Absolutely, Sean. And obviously, we've got some great Australian basketball players playing in the Mountain West uh, at this point. You know, at Boise State and New Mexico, which are two of our best teams coming into this year. And then the University of Wyoming has uh, somebody from Australia as well. So, Invite you, invite Francis, invite anybody that from Australia that wants to come to the basketball championships in Las Vegas in March. We'd, we'd be more than happy to have you and uh, could have an Aussie reunion there if possible. <laughs> good on you, Jeez. Dan. Thanks for talking to us. You got it, guys. Have a good day. Dan Butterley, Senior Associate Commissioner at the Mountain West Conference, or Mountain West as it's known these days, Sean, uh, which started out from scratch, had to find its own way against the institutionalised power of the other conferences in a friendly environment, but still quite an effort. They've done an amazing job, and they've used social media as a way to zero in on exactly what they needed to do. Yeah, it really was just about fitting a need and uh, effectively making sure those colleges had a place to call their call home, effectively. And they've done it, which is amazing. Hey, good of you to come in. Need help with your content? Book in for a content brainstorming session with Sports Geek now. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash work. Thanks to Dan Butterley there from the Mountain West. Um, as I said there in the interview, I've known Dan for many years and was one of my first forays into the sports world working on that research project for the Mountain West in their first couple of years to better understand their fans. Far easier thing to do now uh, with all the information that we get from social media platforms, but it was a good experience and actually help them start figuring out what their fans were, what they wanted and what they could deliver to them and started the genesis of what they developed with their TV network. Um, next up is actually another chat that I had with Francis on ABC Grandstand around the NFL's deal that they did with Twitter to show highlights in in the Twitter stream and also what Facebook are doing to counter that move by Twitter. And our digital sports guru from uh, Sports Geek HQ is with us again. Hey, Sean, how are you going? I'm good, thanks, Francis. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, they're always finding ways to try to one-up each other. Which space are they working into now? Yeah, well, uh, the main thing is, yeah, they seem to be in a bit of an arms race for the for the sports fan and for the sports market. Um, I, keep re- I keep reading articles saying that Twitter is dominating sports or, or Facebook is, and to, to me, you know, sports is dominating Twitter and sports is dominating Facebook. So I actually like to flip it the other way because that's why people are going onto these platforms. So I think there's a bit of the both the social networks taking credit for how great sports is doing in digital when really sports should be taking the credit for how well these social networks are doing because it's a, it's a big driver for uh, for why people are on the networks. And those the, both the networks realise that. They realise that the, the sports market and the live market, so sports music and entertainment, live TV is is where it's at. That's where they've got to get the eyeballs. Uh, they're fighting for that second screen. We keep hearing that second screen experience. You know, what are you doing when you're watching your TV? So your TV's still the main main player in this, but what are you doing when you're on your phone or on your tablet while that's happening? Um, and there's been a couple of announcements over the last week or so that sort of show how they're still fighting for that fan. So Twitter has uh, announced a partnership with the with the NFL, which is the biggest and baddest sport in the land in the, in the US as far as eyeballs and devotion and avidity and, and money. Uh, and so the, the Twitter Amplify product, which is effectively one of their ad products, allows uh, the, will allow the NFL to, to share video clips in the Twitter stream. So you can be uh, scanning down your uh, feed and the NFL or potentially one of the teams, they haven't really broken it down how, how far lower levels it will go, uh, but say Peyton Manning throws a touchdown for the Broncos, they can clip that, put it in a tweet, send it out. You can be flicking through, click it, and watch it in 
in the app, in Twitter, on your phone, right there and then. So, so within a minute or two of that, you could be anywhere in the world if you're following that bang. Yeah, and so, so we've talked about it before. How social is a is a channel changer. Like you're sitting there, and it's you know, you, it's an ad, and or you know, on the TV, and so you go to your second screen, and you're flicking whether you're on Facebook or Twitter, and and someone has alerted you that you should change your channel. And so, what's better than a you know a visual of you know Peyton Manning is hitting the the red zone? Flip it over. And, you know, the NFL have had apps that will alert you to say, hey, they're hitting in the red zone. They've actually got a show on ESPN called The Red Zone. The Red where... Zone, but they've got, they've got apps that do alerts and things, things like that. So it really fits for that. And, again, it, it primes the TV channel. It sends people back because, again, that's the main, the main, the main channel. So Are they, they going to try to make you pay for it? Will they sort of say that in order to, to see it, you need to subscribe to it? No, so, so, so the, the who pays, which is you know, the thing you're asking, is that the NFL is partnering and they're trying to sell that to a sponsor because it's this premium content. So they want to put their major partners, you know, Coca-Cola and Visa and stuff, to have the banner ads or the brought to you by. So there might be a pre-roll of an Oreo ad or so whatever. It'll flash up, it'll bang. flash up, and then you get to, you know, pay the piper, so to speak. Then you get to watch the clip. So because it's super premium content, from a fan's point of view, they're will, they're willing to take that that advertising hit. Um, it's going to be new and it's going to be new and fresh and get a lot of engagement early on. Uh, so there's you know a few sponsors now clamouring to to get that spot. So so Twitter is again trying to show by producing this kind of content, having this deal with the NFL, is that's where Twitter is where it's at and. That's you know where you want to be from a sports point of view. So what's, what's Facebook going to so do? What's Facebook response? going to do now? Knowing that Facebook, from a market share point of view, has more people. Um, now you and I are, are in the Twitter camp. If we're watching sport, we will tweet about it and tweet it with our friends and our. I don't want to call them non-friends, but you know the rest of the people that we're that we're tweeting with and having that conversation. And we get that there's still a lot of people that don't and still do it on Facebook, and they want to do it in that private, semi-private, personal manner and. Watching the uh, the NFL or or baseball or, or AFL grand final, for instance, they will write, "Wow, Peyton Manning that tr- touchdown was great," on Facebook because they're not on Twitter. So what Facebook is Facebook is trying to open up their platform to be a bit more public, a bit more open, a bit more. Uh, uh, so the walled garden that you created with your friends, they're asking you, hey, do you want to let the gates open? Well, the, but they're just trying to give that appearance. So what they've done is they've actually opened up an, an API. Uh, an application programming interface and given access to some uh, some of the TV networks, in this case, Fox Sports. So Fox Sports now is able to report on air to, again, to encourage people to do what Facebook wants them to do on who's trending, uh, what's being said. So, again, Peyton Manning scores. They can put up a graphic and say, oh, the mentions of Peyton Manning have grown 500% in the last 10 minutes. And that they can either do that in the game that you're watching, you're watching Peyton Manning, or you might be watching, you know, the Green Bay Packers, and they put that up, and again, it changes, you, makes you change your channel, makes you engage, or at least triggers you to go, oh, I better go on Facebook and I better talk about the NFL, or I better talk about Fox Sports. So, again, they're both fighting for for that fan. Face, Facebook is coming from the position of market leader, but not necessarily the market leader from a conversation point of view. So, do you still feel that Twitter is the best conversation forum? Oh, it is. It for, is for it for is sports? for me um, person, personally. I agree. Uh, and you know, and I think yeah, once you do get Twitter, and you know, I'm doing air quotes here. Uh, once you do get and understand that that it is that conversation platform, but there is a lot of people that you can still have that. To you, on Facebook, you can put up a post and you can have your five or six mates that are Broncos fans have, that a chat that to, yeah. have, that, have a chat to. And, you know, and there is people that say, I just want to have a chat to some of my mates. And I use that old-fashioned thing called text. And you just text a few of your mates and you just have that really super private conversation. So it is, you know, it, horses for courses uh, to a certain degree. Not which that, one that, not that more... there are any horses on social networks. Yeah, which one do you think is more, uh, more likely to actually turn a buck? Oh, well, yeah, that's that, that's what it comes down to. I think at the moment, Facebook are doing a better job turning their, their advertising wheels, but these kind of things, from a Facebook point of view, are actually better to partner with the sport uh, and help the sport make money and help the sport see that the platform is viable for them, rather than just going, "Hey, thanks, sport, build our audience. Now we're going to advertise to them and we're going to make money." So, these I'd like to see Twitter keep doing more of these partnerships because there hasn't been too many of those partnerships with leagues. They've just sort of been happy to have the relationship. Thanks for bringing all the fans, but they haven't provided much return to sport. Sign up for Sports Geek News at sportsgeekhq.com slash sign up now. 
that actual conversation actually leads quite well into some tweets that happened today. I'm recording this on a Sunday just before the NRL Grand Final. Um, the NRL, the NFL deal, I should say, with Twitter uh, and the being able to put the video inside the Twitter stream is actually done with Snappy TV. Uh, we spoke about Snappy TV back on episode eight uh, when it was being used around Origin uh, by the account Telstra News, Telstra underscore News. Um, and we gave them a bit of a whack at that point in that episode because they were effectively sharing uh, near live uh, near live footage and they really should have been doing it with the NRL account. It wasn't terribly integrated at that stage. Unfortunately, the guys at Telstra News must have been listening to the podcast, and I wish they would, uh, because they've continued uh, with a campaign they've called Fan Army. And uh, I didn't think much of the campaign. I, I saw it getting shared around. I uh, spoke to a few of my teams about it. Uh, the main reason... I didn't think it was a great campaign because it really didn't do much. Va- didn't provide much value for uh, the clubs involved, uh, in the NRL clubs or the NRL or all the fans involved. It was really a me, me, me campaign where Telstra wanted to be in the spotlight. Uh, it wasn't. A, it's. It's not a campaign that's been integrated with anything that the NRL is doing. The NRL is trying to build its digital footprint and grow its audience, and Telstra underscore News uh, appears to be wanting to build its own audience. Uh, it's quite strange in an account called Telstra underscore news, wants to be tweeting NRL all the time. I don't know what exactly why people would be following the account when it's effectively saying it should be sharing in, uh, Telstra news and updates, and pretty much it's been pumping out post after post on NRL in the lead-up to the grand final. So the main thing that got my uh, got my attention was I did send out a tweet to George Rose uh, for the Manly Seagulls, a good mate of mine who was on episode four of the Sports Geek podcast to say good luck for the grand final. And Telstra News decided to send me some fan art to say let's go Manly. Um, now I'm not a Manly fan; they have been a client and wish them well at the in the grand final. But I just it just showed their lack of knowledge of the sports market, how to engage fans. Um, and just doing a little bit of a little bit of research because if they had have checked their Twitter stream, I actually did give them a bit of a whack on on Twitter just a couple of hours before they sent that tweet. So it's just a case of lack of execution. Um, and the other point of the of the campaign is that it, it's living in the vacuum. That's Twitter. It's a Twitter only campaign. And um, as much as I'm a fan of Twitter, it's something that should be integrated with everything else you're doing. Uh, there was actually a really good uh, blog post by Simon Rogers from the uh, the data team at Twitter analysing how uh, Major League Baseball have done from a Twitter point of view. And what I would have liked, and they looked at a few different methods of, of tweeting to saying oh, all of these all of these different types of campaigns work really work really well. Um, but I think the piece that should be should be highlighted, um, the first takeaway is that any concerted effort by a team to engage its fans will lead in an increase in followers and engagement. I think that's the piece of the article that everyone forgot to read. And in the case of Telstra News, they forgot to read. Pretty much if you're doing anything more and making a concerted effort on Twitter, you are going to get more followers. Um, But my main contention when talking with teams about campaigns on Twitter is what are you trying to drive? Yes, you do want to have more followers and you want to get retweets and you want to get engagement, but you want people to go to your website. You want people to consume your content on your website. You want people to like you on Facebook. You want people to uh, get back to your home base and get into your databases. So if you just follow the the steps of, uh, again, what Twitter is outlining in this this, uh, blog post about doing play-by-play or doing Twitter takeovers or doing Vine videos, of course Vine videos are going to get retweeted because not many people are doing them and it's a short, sharp, uh, video uh, of potentially behind the scenes but that does not mean every video should be a vine video so i think there's there's just a case of you've got to take a broader approach you can't be uh put your eggs all in one basket in this case twitter again this is not uh this is not me having a go at twitter it's just a matter of understanding that you've got to remember your main one of your main kpis is actually getting people back to your website so being engaging on Twitter is one way to deepen that relationship with your fans, but then you want to drive traffic back. I'd love to see the guys at Twitter actually start sharing back some data of what kind of tweets drive more traffic back to your site, uh, what kind of tweets uh, 
drive more conversation with your with your fans. Um, myself, Twitter takeovers is an example. I'm not a fan of that because Twitter is so transient and so conversational. What happens to the fan that com- comes into a Twitter takeover halfway through? What happens? You spend a lot of time shaping that voice of the fan, sorry, of your account. That can be very jarring for someone coming in halfway through because you don't. It doesn't have that. Uh, read it all at once type of mentality that uh, you know a store a storify those kind of things where you can you're reading it from the start and to the end um, if you come into a mid mid section it might not work and again we have seen some issues with uh, Twitter takeovers where uh, the person taking over is is a little bit loose so to a certain degree of course it's going to uh, uh, drive a little bit more engagement because people are trying to see that that car crash potentially potentially happen so yeah the telstra news one uh it was a little bit of a twitter rant by me today um after getting that uh, fan army tweet about george rose um to me it just is not providing much value for the fan it's not integrated with the nrl at all uh, the fact they're not using the hashtag was quite disappointing um so for mine yeah not very well executed at all that's enough i'm get, like i said i'm getting off my digital high horse right now um and that brings me to the end of the episode. Episode 20 is next. And what I want is get start getting some, I want to get some questions in and maybe do an Ask Sports Geek one in the next couple of episodes. Uh, just a few notes uh, for this week as we have the sounds of the game playing. And thank you to Anthony Dynan uh, from Ireland for sending in the sounds of the game. The sounds you're hearing uh, below my voice is from the Ireland hurling final. So, yes, my, my Irish heritage is showing through here. Never been to Ireland, but my ancestors are Irish with a name like Sean. How could, I, how could they not be? Uh, so thanks, Anthony, for sending it through. And, again, if you're at a game this weekend or any time, uh, please grab, take your phone out, record some audio and send it in. I'd love to include it on the show for the Sounds of the Game segment. Um, other notes this week, if you're in Melbourne, uh, Tuesday night at the Honey Bar, uh, my other podcast, Beers, Blokes and Business Podcast. You can go to beersblokesbusiness.com. Uh, we're having a launch party, uh, so you can go and get some tickets there. You'll get a stubby holder upon entry and a free beer. Also excited to announce that we are going to relaunch Sports Geek News. It's now going to be a weekly newsletter. It's going to include all the links of all the articles that I've read and tweeted and shared on LinkedIn. So if you've missed anything, that's the email that you want to get weekly. Uh, you can sign up. Uh, That's about it for this episode. If you go to iTunes and leave a review, I'd very much appreciate it. And thank you very much for the feedback that I'm getting on Twitter, LinkedIn, and the like. Uh, Until next week, my name is Sean Callanan from Sports Geek. Hashtag SportsBiz, hashtag SM Sports, hashtag out. Check out which teams work with Sports Geek at sportsgeekhq.com slash clients. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. Find all Sports Geek podcasts at sportsgeekhq.com slash SGP. Thanks for listening to the Sports Geek Podcast.